My name is Annie Berkey. I am a staff writer at Fierce Healthcare, and I'll be moderating today's discussion about patients' views of health data privacy and security. While healthcare seems to be a buzz with some thrilling topics like generative AI, for every one of those conversations, it seems to me there are just as many happening in hushed tone around cybersecurity. Today's panel of distinguished experts include Dr. Stephen Lane, Chief Medical Officer of Health Gorilla, Bethany Corbin, Privacy Attorney and Founder of Fem Innovation, Dr. Grace Cordovano, a board certified patient advocate, advocate and co founder of Unblock Health, Dr. Mohammed Jafari, Privacy Co Chair of HL7, and Lucia Savage, Attorney and Chief Privacy and Regulatory Officer at Omada Health. Before diving into the discussion, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stephen Lane. He's going to share a few key findings from Health Gorilla's State of Patient Privacy Report based on a survey of a representative sample of over 120, uh, 1,200 uh, patients about their perspectives on health information sharing. Thanks so much, Annie. Really appreciate the chance to share this, this information. As Annie mentioned, uh, Health Gorilla surveyed 1,213 patients across the United States who received medical care between May of 2022 and May of 2023. So very, very recent survey uh, that we're discussing here today. The age and gender distribution of the survey sample were consistent with the US census data. And uh, move on to the next slide. I want to really acknowledge the decades long history of patient surveys on data privacy and security. Uh, as you can see here, the ONC and the Health Information National Trends surveys have conducted a number of notable surveys in the last 10 years. And while some of the past findings still ring true today, the increasing digitization of health data and the recent patterns of health data breaches uh, seem to have really impacted patients' perceptions of the security and privacy of their records. And we're gonna go into that detail next. So in, in our recent survey, we found that the majority of patients don't trust big tech companies with the handling and storage of their health data, with 65% of respondents expressing some range of distrust. There, were many, there are many potential reasons for this. Uh, obviously, patients are concerned about data privacy, potential profit motives, inadequate regulation, and potential misuse of their sensitive information. Uh, what we see here is that an overwhelming majority of patients, fully 95% of the survey respondents, expressed concern about a potential data breach or leak of their medical records. Uh, in light of recent breaches in healthcare, it's no surprise that patients are apprehensive about the security of their medical information. HCA Healthcare, Henry Ford, Cerebral, and GoodRx are just a few high-profile providers that have experienced breaches within the past year, which probably is contributing to this observed level of distrust. What you can see here is that our survey found that the majority of patients are indeed comfortable with providers accessing their data without their explicit consent when this is required for treatment purposes, but less so when the information is being used to secure payment, to support healthcare operations, or public health purposes. And this is a fascinating finding that we'll dive into further during our discussion. On the next slide here, uh, which I think is a, really a pleasant and positive finding, is that patients clearly desire access to their medical records, with a remarkable 83% of surveyed respondents reporting accessing their own medical records in the last 12 months. I mean, that's, that's remarkable uh, and really quite exciting as the industry gears up for new permitted use cases under the new trusted exchange framework and common agreement, which is going to include individual access services and the ability for individuals to request their data using this new platform. So overall, patients stated that they found it easy to access their medical records through a range uh, in options that exist today. 30% noted that the process was extremely easy, 42% somewhat easy, 21% found it to be difficult to varying degrees. Uh, and one of our panelists actually recently completed her own survey 
uh, in this same area that I suspect we might get to hear a little bit about, about later, which drills into some of the details here. So let's open it up to the panel and discuss the implications of these findings. Brilliant. Well, to start off, um, consumer fear around medical record breaches is an important issue to address, obviously. Um, many experts now say that data breaches have gone from a matter of if to when. Just this past month, news broke of a data breach affecting millions of patients at HCA Healthcare and thousands at Henry Ford Health. For this question, let's start with Bethany and Lucia. How do we give patients confidence that their medical records will be kept private and secure? Um, I'll take a stab at it. I think it's really important to separate um, security or the lack thereof because of criminal activity and an actual sort of people not understanding how data is used and being surprised by it, whether that is in a situation like GoodRx, not inside HIPAA, sharing data through pixels with social media, or, or even the uses we put for data in traditional healthcare, like measuring whether doctors have um, hit the markers on preventive care services. Um, and so it's really important. There's always going to be criminal activity, and criminal activity has definitely increased. Um, there's a lot more activity as the world is politically destabilized. You can kind of track that over time. Um, in that context, it's incumbent upon the traditional healthcare organizations and uh, ones that are not inside HIPAA to really do best practices of engineering. And I think that. You know, for a normal consumer, they're not going to know. They're not going to know what HCA's uh, security engineering practices are or Amata's or anybody's. But that's what the, the law requires, that you try to do your best to do this, not the minimum and the least. Um, and then on the, the sort of surprise, your data has been put somewhere because of me as an organization or a particular organization's business efforts. That is a thing consumers actually can check out because that's in terms of services and privacy policies. And you can ask. Um, so, for example, at Amada, if people ask privacy questions about what we do with our data, we answer them. Um, and that's, and that again, it's a best practice, but that's a best practice in handling your consumers. Bethany, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with everything that you said, Lucia. You know, I think it's difficult to, it, you know, for consumers to feel like their data is ever going to be 100% secure or private, because in today's world, as you know, hackers are getting more and more sophisticated as the world becomes unstable from a political aspect, it's very difficult to ever make that time of assurance because Annie, as you said, right, it's, it's a matter of when, not if. You know, what we can be doing as consumers as well is demanding more privacy and security with respect to things like healthcare applications or health tech and wearables that we're using, because a lot of times those applications and products can fall outside of HIPAA. And so there's a lot of confusion that I've found for consumers regarding how their data is actually protected in those apps and why we could give the same data to an application and to our healthcare provider, and it might be protected in one context and not the other. And so I think placing a, you know, a higher burden on those apps and those products to live up to those best security and best privacy standards that Lucia was talking about. I think that's going to be absolutely essential going forward. Yeah, we are going to get into that a little bit, a few questions in the future. Um, but first, I want to go back to something that Stephen brought up when he was going through the report, um, talking about patients feeling uneasy about sharing their data in a variety of use cases. Um, only 71% were comfortable sharing their information for treatment purposes. So this is a two-part question. One, uh, why do you think patients are so hesitant about sharing their data, even in treatment-based exchanges? And two, as movers in the space, how do you balance the concerns of patients about sharing data for things like healthcare operations, payment, public health research, et cetera, um, and the systematic and clinical benefits of increasing efficiencies. And I, I think we're going to start with Stephen for this. You know, I think this is a really interesting set of questions because, you know, HIPAA has been around for decades, right? And it says that providers uh, and payers can share data without consent or authorization for treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. Um, despite, the, and a lot of people have heard of HIPAA, even though they aren't expected to know the details of it. But it's interesting to see that, that it's a minority of people who are comfortable with the data sharing that is allowed and supported in federal law. I mean, so I think that that tells us a lot. I think um, 
I don't know that we have gained any ground or lost any ground in this regard, but it clearly highlights the need for education. And I can tell you in my practice, I spend a fair bit of time educating people about the privacy of their information and sometimes the lack of that privacy. You know, as much as we want to be able to assure that data is kept private, we can't do that 100%. We couldn't do it on paper. We certainly can't do it with electronic information, uh, with all the different ways that it can get out. So I think, you know, your, your question is, um, how, you know, how can we help support the appropriate sharing? How can we move from today where we can share for treatment, payment, healthcare operations to a future where we want to be able to use data to improve the efficiency and the value of the care that's being provided? And, and I hate to say it, it really comes back to education. Uh, I don't think most providers care or spend as much time on this as I do. Um, and, uh, and I don't have nearly enough time to spend on it, you know, given that you're also trying to practice medicine. So I think really, it's up to you know the government, to industry, to to private organizations, to work together to try to get the word out. I mean, I think that there's been a lot of buzz around the information blocking rule, uh, and uh, again, I sort of live inside that bubble, so I don't know how much that's gotten out into the general uh, discussion. But I think that's these are opportunities uh, as we are able to share more data, specifically with patients, uh, to have these discussions. Can I, can I add something, Annie? Just a little historical perspective. So you can go back to 2011. I just checked um, in the early days of the laws that kind of put all of this electronic exchange really into motion. And even then, when we were surveying this, about 10% of the population just wanted to 100% control every movement of their own data, period. And people don't really realize that like for your doctor to bill your insurance company, they have to tell your insurance company what kind of care they supplied at a very granular level. And that's in fact where all these HIPAA rules come from. So they don't really understand like there's a lot of PHI that just happens so that your insurance company will pay for your care. And at the same time, as we've um, gone deeper and deeper into interoperability, and we've tried to actually bring to life the idea that patients have a right to get their own data, which is something uh, the traditional system is still wrapping its head around. The opposite poll, we have about 10% of people who ardently want every single piece of data in their record. And the other 90% are like, oh my God, carpooling is hard enough. I don't need my health data. And so we have these really quite opposite approaches to it. And in the middle is the bolus of people. And that's your 71% of people who still trust the system. And maybe they trust it because they're old like me. And they remember when your specialist called your primary care physician on a landline to get the information on your medical record. And there was a 20 minute conversation, which is uh, what kind of health information exchange was occurring in 1996 when HIPAA became a federal law. And, and I do want to add to that from a technology perspective, I think uh, the general expectations of privacy and the intuitive expectations of privacy by the uh, consumer is really driven by, by the awareness of what is possible. So if, if there is awareness that there are certain protections that are, that are already implementable by, by the vendors, then that uh, the expectation kind of grows towards that direction. So to be aware of what is possible, I think is, is kind of the starting point that drives, is the prime mover of what drives the general intuitive expectation of privacy that would later translate into regulate, regulations and regulatory requirements to be uh, implemented by the vendors. And that, oh, Grace, please go ahead. Just wanna jump in and say that what's missing here from the patient and care partner perspective is we don't really have act actionable insights and reporting to tell us what are the strictest security protocols out there and who's using it? And how do I quickly search my zip code and see or my state or compare centers of excellence or my local community centers for what they're doing? I don't have reporting on data use and who, how my data is being used, uh, whether individually or on a population health level. I don't have those controls. So there, while I'll build on what Stephen is saying, that education is needed, we have to recognize that there's a powerlessness that comes into to play as being an individual receiving care because we just don't have access to the information tools and technology and personalized segment data segmentation controls that are needed to really level the playing field here. 
And I think this leads pretty easily into our next question. Um, I want to start with Lucia for this one. Um, how have legal and regulatory bodies already worked to address patient privacy concerns? And what changes do you think are needed to keep up with evolving laws, technologies, practices, so on? Yeah, this is like a whole webinar or two all by itself. So I'll try to give a very uh, high level kind of take on it. So um, within traditional healthcare, the HIPAA is the minimum federal law. And most states have additional laws that apply to the healthcare professionals within them, doctor confidentiality rules. For example, in California, California Medical Information Act applies to physicians, nurse practitioners. And by the way, it applies to digital health apps that are providing care. So um, the states do take action in that way through their healthcare professionals. And anything that's happening with a healthcare professional who's licensed really needs to conform to those laws. So then on top of that, you have um, commercial versus nonprofit health care. So commercial health care is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission and most state consumer protection agencies. And so outside of HIPAA, you see an increase actually a pretty large number of states right now have passed specialized consumer protection laws that are aimed at kind of this digital transactional space. And some of them specifically cover healthcare like Washington state. And some of them are general um, like California um, Consumer Privacy Act, which has rules about information about health outside HIPAA, but also rules about financial data and your travel data and your phone usage data and all other kinds of data. So we have got about 12 states, don't quote me on that, but about 12 um, that have passed laws or have laws very far along in the process. So people are really beginning to take action, but for the consumer, it's just a confusing mishmash, right? They know HIPAA, it's, it's uh, there's like a uh, social media bake off the most understood law in America and HIPAA always comes in number two. The number one is the First Amendment. HIPAA is number two when people vote. So people understand the branding, but they don't understand the rules. And and then when they go out into when a consumer goes out into the marketplace, they, they don't even know what questions to ask, to Grace's point, let alone where to get really solid information about what an organization's practices are. And if you're a person who's managing the health of a of a sick family member, like you want to do that. You don't want to be managing the privacy. So um, I have long been an advocate of a national consumer law. The FTC is taking action. They have a proposed rule on the street right now on their um, personal health records. There's a lot of activism by the FTC. They just blogged yesterday. Uh, you can Google it, FTC Baker's Dozen. It'll pop right up. Kind of a survey of their most recent action. So they are taking action that is, in my opinion, overdue. It would have been better for us if we'd had these kind of guidances in 2015, 2016, but here we are. I hope that those take root because what the FTC is really trying to do is make an object lesson out of every litigation it does so that the people in the industry where that company was go, oh, I don't want to get in trouble with the FTC. I should do this other practice instead. I should improve my practices. But that takes a while. The lighthouse effect takes a while to take root. I don't know, Grace, you're you're the patient voice on this call. Did I miss something? No, I think you're covering it beautifully. And I want to just emphasize that more and more patients and families are hyper aware because there's actually been excellent reporting on this. And I think that the reporting has become more front and center because our hospitals and providers are not being as forthcoming. And oftentimes it's the journalists that get a hold of the information and then it hits peer to peer support communities and advocates. And we can't believe what's going on in our backyards and we're grateful for the information. And now we start investigating. So I just want to emphasize that patients and consumers are becoming more aware and this whole uh, immediate reaction to say, well, there's not enough literacy and they don't really know, oh, we know. And it, the knowledge is growing. So I, I would appreciate a greater emphasis, not just from a health literacy standpoint, but giving us tangible reporting. You know, I think about the ratings that come out, the US News World and Health Report top 100 hospitals. Well, tell me, tell me about the security practices and where can I quickly search and, and take a look at what my oncologist or what my cardiologist or primary care doctor is doing or not doing so I can celebrate it or switch my care. We just don't have that type of reporting and analytics available for us to make these types of decisions. 
You know, we've talked about education, and uh, I wonder, are there any entities uh, in the country that are focusing on that sort of writing curricula to be included in either health class or civics class? I mean, not that we want to legislate, you know, school uh, cur curricula, that, that, that can be fraught, but, uh, but, but some sort of just a resource center where, where these information can be organized and sent out to be made more available to teach, especially young people, adolescents who have particularly interesting health data privacy issues that they're dealing with. I'm gonna jump in. Oh, go ahead. I would say the FTC has an excellent consumer education page that's about the FTC's rules. But, you know, people aren't gonna like go to the FTC. I mean, you have to be a little bit geeky to go there. Um, but I also think it's uh, education is a tough one because to Grace's point, consumers are going to look for the thing that's meaningful to them, uh, not something that a top down says they should know. And we're also in a world where people don't even understand their EOBs because mm -hmm. the system is just so complicated and, uh, and opaque. I will say that the Light Collective is doing some fantastic work on raising awareness and education. So I definitely encourage everyone to take a look at their work. And I'm wondering if um, Carissa is someone working behind the scenes for us. I wonder if she can put some of these resources in the chat uh, so people are able to follow up later. I know I would love to send them to my parents so they stop asking me questions. <laughs> Don't tell them I said that. Um, Next, I want to throw one over to Mohammed. Um, how successful do you think technical standards and frameworks, such as those developed by the HL7, are in supporting healthcare organizations and other data uh, health data holders in regards to implementing privacy measures and ensuring interoperability? I I, I think th this is like a twofold uh, situation. There is a vibrant community of uh, patient advocates, people who are expert in health policy and technologists, you know, and engineers who are actively working on these problems. And they're often way ahead of what the regulations would require um, and even ahead of the common expectations of privacy. So there, there are standards and there, there is active uh, work that's being done constantly on these things. Um, I, but but I, so for, for, for on the one hand there's that, but I, I think on the other hand, the the cycle of excellence for a standard is to actually be adopted, implemented, and then the feedback is provided back to to improve the standard, cover the gaps, you know, uh, find more realistic places where it can be improved, you know, and find the blind spots in the initial assessments, and also keep up with the emerging use cases, right? So I, I, I want to say that despite the fact that there is a lot of work that's been done on the standards, the adoption and the implementation has, uh, has been lagging behind. And part of that is because of the lack of general awareness about these expectations of privacy, uh, but uh, which also is sort of in tandem with the regulatory requirements. I think I would often say that uh, the technology is usually ahead of what is being required. And um, so we could always do better from the standpoint of what technology, what is feasible technology. Uh, so the, I, I, so I, I, I would say like there's both sides of that uh, answer that, you know, we do have a lot of uh, work and we, we do have a lot of standards, but then the adoption and the, the improvement and the maturity of the standard is some, something that, that needs to be worked on uh, more. Having said that, Mohammed, I think a number of us on the panel, you know, were quite involved in providing feedback to the, the Office of the National Coordinator about their recent proposed rule, uh, where they suggested some specific standards that might be used to support especially individuals' HIPAA rights to request restrictions on the use of their data. Uh, so I think we're all looking forward to a final rule coming out later this year, which I think is likely to really set the, uh, the timeline for what specific standards will be required by when, and then presumably that's gonna also include what is gonna be required for the certified health IT and electronic health record vendors to support. And so I think we are gonna start seeing some incremental change in that way. So I know you and many others have worked so hard on these standards, which as you say, are way ahead of practices. So I think we're gonna to start to see some of the practices catching up as these rules move forward. 
And I know this is a bit of a nitty gritty question, but would anyone else like to pause it and answer? I just want to add one thing. I think it's really, it'll be just as an academic exercise, interesting to see how it all shakes out because the ONC rule applies to certified EHRs, which are the ones that are primarily used in hospital systems and traditional settings. But particularly since COVID, there's a lot more healthcare being supplied in a non-traditional setting. And those organizations, OMADA being one of them, we have bespoke EHRs. We built a thing that works for our business that's not subject to ONC's rules for a bunch of complicated legal questions. But you know, at Amada, we've got me, I'm an ex one seer like I know how to do all the things, but not every small innovative company that might pr be providing a healthcare service that really meets the need of a population that's not getting served by traditional healthcare is going to have, A, they may not have a certified EHR, so standards, they'll be, they'll be evaluating how to use standards in a different way. Um, and two, they may not have the capital to build to those standards. So they'll, we'll have to just see how it all shakes out as a word of caution. Well, and just to pile on that, Lucia, I think that, you know, Health Gorilla in particular provides interoperability and data exchange services for a lot of those small digital health companies that have their own technology. So I think there are other opportunities, even if the core technology doesn't support this, that some of their, their support services or connectivity brokers could provide this level of support. I just jump in. I agree that this is a standards issue and there's frameworks, but it sounds like to me from the patient and care partner perspective, I trust my doctor and I trust my health system. It's that marketing department that and advertising that seems to be not getting a message here. And there seems to be leakage happening there. So if I had to reframe this, I almost don't trust the marketing and advertising department because they don't seem to be on board with how private and sensitive my health information is. So it seems like there's a lack of consistency in communicating what the strictest of security and best practices are just internally, uh, if I'm understanding some of the situation correctly. I, I think that that is what is going to have the light cast on it as OCR marches through its hospital evaluations. Um, I think you know, I've written about this in books. It is so important for the professionals, whether they're um, standards professionals, uh, security professionals, privacy professionals, to really build strong cross-functional and collaborative relationships across their orgs, not only so that people trust them to come and get the advice, but also that they have their ear to the ground. What is the org up to? And they can, you know, look at something and go, hmm, I see what you're trying to accomplish. Let's do that in a better way. And yeah, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sort of takes me to like uh, the second point I wanted to make, and I think there is uh, definitely a gap in uh, in technology in in the part that connects with the end user and the consumer. So to be able to communicate to provide a user experience and user interface in a way that uh, understanding the controls of privacy and understanding the kind of uh, reporting and auditing that 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 a, a end user can can be entitled to. And to create that uh, missing link, I think that's where the technology is lagging behind. And also uh, partly because of the funding model, because the interoperability standards are kind of funded by the big players who are actually doing the B2B part of the thing. And uh, to to bring that into the, the, the connection with the end user, I think is something that needs to be worked on further. And I think also what we're talking about here is the variety of modalities now offered. We have in person, synchronous telehealth, virtual first or asynchronous telehealth. Um, and due to digital technology and smartphones, consumers have also been able to access hundreds of thousands of apps from other health services um, with few ways, as we're talking about education here, uh, for customers to distinguish between the app from a provider covered by HIPAA and an app outside of HIPAA. So I want to first throw this question to the attorneys in the room. Uh, do you think these results provide evidence of that confusion, the results in the survey? And what can be done to enhance trust in this space? Is something more required by industry in addition to what the FTC is currently proposing for personal health records? You wanna take a stab at that, Bethany? Yeah, I'll jump in. So, so absolutely, I think there is huge confusion amongst 
patients, especially, and consumers who are using these applications about what legal requirements and privacy standards govern their applications. Because when you're using something that's connected with a covered entity, like a MyChart, right, that's going directly to your provider, that data can be covered by HIPAA and by the other national and state standards that we have in place. If you're doing something like, let's say, a period tracking app, right, where that's collecting potentially even more sensitive health data than what you would give to your provider, that oftentimes is not going to be covered by HIPAA. And I've seen amongst patients a huge confusion and just assumption that HIPAA and the corresponding, you know, privacy and security rules that they're going to apply to all of the types of, you know, health technology applications that are out there. And so that's not what's happening. And I think that is fueling some of the mistrust, especially now that we're in a post-OBS environment that has really come to light in the femtech and women's health spaces, where there's been mass mistrust now about how those companies that are collecting that sensitive reproductive health data, how they're using it, how they're sharing it, how that could get downstream, how it's being sold in a way that could potentially link them to reproductive health services that may be illegal in their state. And so, you know, it's not like we've done anything massively different with privacy for these health tech apps in the last year or so, is that consumers are now getting smarter and realizing these are the ways in which my health data could be used downstream. Here's how it could harm me. But here's the problem. We don't necessarily in this environment, especially for health tech apps, have a way to make privacy and security a market differentiator yet. Because as we've talked about, there's no way for a patient to say, you know what, this period tracking app is better than this period tracking app from a privacy and security perspective. Sure, they have the privacy policies, right, which nobody reads um, and everybody clicks accept. But then even if they do have the privacy policies, we have the recent cases like we've seen with the FTC with Flow and Premom, where that data is being used in ways in which the privacy policy says it's not going to be used anyway. And so I think I think what we're going to see, and I think this is going to flow into other areas beyond just women's health care, is consumers being much more aware of how their data is being used by healthcare applications, looking at how those disclosures may affect the uses of their health data. And I think that we're going to see some type of regulatory scheme at some point trying to cover those health technology applications so that patients can feel more confident using them given this, this very different privacy structure that we have in place. And Lucia, I'm going to turn it over to you because I know you have some great insights on this as well. Yeah, I mean, I, all that, Omada is 100% a covered entity and, and it's not a thing we can like choose to be or not be. And one of the key uh, messages on that uh, FTC blog from yesterday is, you know, the only organization that can say a healthcare entity is HIPAA compliant is the Office of Civil Rights at HHS. It's not a seal you can buy. And that is definitely a hallmark, like don't lie to people. And that's been FTC standard for over 100 years. So that's something that people should be able to actually wrap their heads around. I think there's a couple of things consumers can really do um, and care partners to empower themselves when they're looking at an app. One thing that's a very clear line here is how does the app, the company that developed the app get paid? Where do they get the money to keep that app going in the marketplace? There's three ways. They can monetize the data you give them. So you're the product bad. They could get paid by you on a direct-to-consumer basis, then FTC rules apply. Uh, they have to tell you the truth. They can't lie, et cetera. Or they could get paid by your insurance company or your employer. If that is happening, that latter thing, they are in HIPAA by law. And this is actually a pretty easy, bright line if you can figure out where to get the information to Grace's point. And what I would love to see is I would love to see the app stores draw this line. Here are the health apps that are from HIPAA covered entities. That we know MyChart, Omada, whatever. Here are the help. Here's the five thousand or however many other apps it is that are not uh, paid by your insurance company or your employer, and so HIPAA doesn't apply. That at least is something that is discernible. The app developers can give the app stores documentation. They now have to give documentation about privacy practices. Like that is a thing that. Um, could be done that would make the consumer's life a lot easier. It'd be a step in the direction that Grace is asking for, which is, I have thousands of choices. How do I, how do I tell? Um, I do think a regulatory scheme is coming, but the thing about regulatory schemes is if a company wants to do the right thing, they'll do the regulatory scheme 
because they want to do the right thing up front. Other companies will take the risk, um, maybe uh, fudge it around the edges or not pay attention to the scheme or have a privacy policy that looks all nice, but under the hood, it's not complied with. Those are, we don't find that out till after the fact, till investigation ensues. Yeah, I, think, I, think, I think there's a role for technology also to facilitate making sense of those privacy policies that are complex to, to facilitate understanding the certification of, you know, who is covered by what. So there is a role for technology there as well. And that's why I was referring to earlier about where there, there, there needs to be more, more work done. Sorry, Stephen. No, no, I was just gonna say, I, I think the idea, you know, most consumers understand the idea of a, a seal of approval of some sort. You know, those of us who are old enough remember the good housekeeping seal, but there, there are a lot, lots of those. And so I think your idea, Lucia, of, you know, this is an app that's being offered in such a way that the data you put into it is covered by HIPAA. Um, that, that sounds really good. You know, I think most of us are aware of the Karen Alliance and the work that they've done with their code of conduct for, you know, and then the small number of apps that have signed on to that. But I think we need that kind of framework that where we can, again, educate our patients, ourselves, our, our communities about you know, that, that differentiator, because of course you don't want to stifle the market. You want to allow a thousand flowers to bloom and, and people to create apps outside of HIPAA, but at least making it clear which ones are the most likely to maintain the privacy and security of your data would be very helpful. Well, I agree, Stephen. I think the other thing that we have to do too is for consumers, we have to demand it. You know, we have to demand that we want to see these standards, right? That we need this information in order to make our competitive analyses, right? And our decisions as consumers, because if, if we don't demand it, right, we get exactly what we've had, which is the way in which we can't compare these applications. Now we're seeing this in women's health, right? Consumers are demanding it. We're seeing more companies be proactive and change their privacy and security policies and start to be more transparent with consumers about how they're using data. And that's been really exciting to see. But until now, it's not served enough of a market differentiator for consumers to warrant the increased cost that the applications, right, and the companies have to take on. So I think, too, a large part of it is in our hands as consumers to demand the information we need. I just, I just want to add one more thing. So six years ago, actually six and a half years ago, almost seven now, Omada chose to become a brand di differentiator in security. And we've invested in it consistently over time. And, and it's a thing that you have to choose to do. This is not a thing. They're, the engineers, the security engineers, the guys who know the IEEE standards, Mohammed, they know exactly what to do. You have to hire them and you have to fund them from a security perspective. And so that I think that you know, for a, a person who wants to make an academic study of it, if you go and look at the really big security breaches, not, not leakage from the marketing department, Grace, but like somebody stole the encryption key, uh, which also looks like it may have been what happened with HCA, you'll find that they could have engineered it a little bit more rigorously and maybe they didn't. I'm going to take this on a little bit of a turn. You actually all answered a question I was going to ask. So brilliantly done. Thank you for that. Um, this question is for Grace. According to the patient privacy report, patients generally find it easy to get their own medical records. However, the experience of accessing one's own medical records may vary significantly depending on who you are, where you've received care, how complex your care has been. Uh, what are some challenges that patients continue to face today in terms of getting their own records, getting their data to new care teams, and what can be done to support patients in this area? You know, Annie, when I read the report and I saw the statistic and percentage, I raised an eyebrow and I said, wow, easy. And I I said, okay, I dove in a little deeper and I, I did some investigating. I think it's wonderful that that many patients are reporting that it was easy to get their records. I do want to offer a little bit of perspective. So I work primarily in the oncology space and with patients that have multiple comorbidities and in some cases, very catastrophic conditions and in end of life care. It is not easy to get access because of the breadth and spectrum of information that is required for that patient uh, to get the care that they need. Uh, I 
on a daily basis am fighting to try to get images on CDs, access to pathology slides, tissue blocks. So when we talk about records, it's not just the paper-based stuff. There's a lot more that encompasses and we're just not there yet. So I, in high school, my first job was filing medical records. So I had a, a loving relationship with these manila folders that I was filing thousands of sheets of paper and I had paper cuts all over. So I know I've firsthand seen the progress where now all of the patients that I serve, I can log into their portals and I can see the records updating in almost real time. So that is definitely progress. And Stephen has also grounded me when I come to him fretting about all of the difficulties I'm facing that we have made progress in, a sh in really a short amount of time and becoming electronic. There are challenges. And I think the challenges really are that patients are receiving care in many different places and it's all not coming in. And it's also not all going out to the point of care on follow-up, that primary care doctor, um, the oncologist after a surgical procedure. So the patient and their family are still required to be that quarterback. And that role becomes much more important the more dire the situation is. That person cannot afford for a test result to fall through. That person cannot afford to have that genetic or tumor marker test not be relayed to the right next person or player because we're talking about life and death situations. We're talking about treatments that are extremely expensive and care that uh, is life-changing. Once you start a treatment, it may mean that you're no longer able to have children. Uh, there are consequences to certain treatments. So um, it is so important that patients have access to all of it. So I'm thrilled to see ease of access, but I wanna see ease of access across all of the different categories, whether you're a proactive wellness seeker, whether you're dealing with an acute instance of uh, an encounter in healthcare, whether you have multiple comorbidities, something life altering, life limiting, and even in end of life care. We don't talk about end of life care. As someone who works in end of life care very intimately, if there's a time in your life when you need real time access to information, it's then because those are some of the most difficult decisions and most powerful and critical decisions that a family needs to make. And we shut people out as if they don't need information at a skilled nursing facility or at a hospice inpatient or even at home. So I, I'd like to see more done in that space, but we're, we're making progress for sure. And Stephen, I know you're our resident physician here. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think as Grace says, if your care is complex, if your care is being received from a team that is beyond the walls of one system, it is gonna be much harder to, to get access to and, and bring together all of your information. I mean, I think this is one of the really exciting things about the coming Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement or TEFCA is the idea that right up front and center along with the, the use of sharing of data for treatment purposes, is this individual access services. Uh, and really, it has been a major focus of, of the federal agencies, the ONC and CMS, to really focus on helping individuals to get their own data. And I mean, I know that obviously not every patient is going to find that interesting or worthwhile. But I think when you look out in the world, increasingly people are keeping track of their financial data, of their shopping data, of their exercise data. I mean, people have gotten way more used to collecting and managing their data, at least some people have. Uh, so I think we are going to progressively see more interest in this and the federal rules and regulations are giving us more tools and more access. So I think I think we are going to see a sea change. Um, but Grace, I really think you're you're right that it, it sort of depends. And, and as you put in the question, Annie, it depends on whom you ask, you know, and what kind of care and where they were getting care as to how easy it is for them to get access to that data and really make use of it. Can I just add one more thing? I think it's really important to think about equity here, because a lot of the technology for accessing data, and by the way, this is in the original HIPAA rule, so it's a 23-year-old rule. There's no new rules here. It's just that we're applying new technology to old rules. You know, we we're, we here in cities are used to broadband on every street corner. And there are huge chunks of America that don't, A, don't have broadband. B, can't afford the data plans that drive the smartphones. And so we really have to think about um, people who need to know, two things, people who want to know and, and manage their own health data in a context where there isn't a simple app for it. That's one. And secondly, 
people who depend on the healthcare system to move it where it needs to go because they don't have the tools and skills and time, they're maybe managing a complicated family to actually handle and move the data around themselves. I saw that in one of the chats. Like there, people are very diverse in their abilities, their desires, and their technical environments in which this happens. But for the most part, the actual health systems and hospitals have actually the technology where they can move it as they need to for treatment. It's about what's what does the patient need for the dialogue for their life. And they're just important equity components to all of that. And I think, Lucia, it's important to bring up time, time, energy, effort. If you have three kids, if you're a single parent. Language. Yeah, language. Exactly. Like, can you get home and be able to do these things? Um, and I, that's the question and the tone I would like to end this conversation on before we get to the Q&A. And I got a lot of Q&A questions that hopefully we'll be able to have time for. Um, if you were to meet a patient today who has anxiety regarding the legitimate exchange of their data, what would you tell them they have to gain from interoperability? In other words, what is this all for? I mean, I'll, take a, I'll take a stab at that because my best friend is a tech person and is completely skeptical of this, one of my best friends. And what I've said to her is, well, look at you, look at what you went through caring for your mother and your father at end of life. And wouldn't you want your parents' doctors to actually have the complete information to manage their care? And she sort of thoughtfully says yes, but then she has some health conditions. She's like, but I don't want these other people to know about my health conditions because they might take away my insurance. Now we don't have that anymore because of the ACA, but it is definitely a ghost that haunts us in how people feel about the, their health information or I don't want them to know because I'll be discriminated against. List, list your reasons, everything from uh, gender transition to HIV status and, and race, all the things. So we have to respect that people have a healthy skepticism or doubts about how the healthcare system treats them. And that is a context in which information exchange has to live and breathe. And I'll just pile on, Lucia, just from the perspective of a primary care physician. I mean, what I know is that I can take the best care of you as an individual if I have access to all the data. Now, I don't have to have all of it in front of my eyes at all times, but you know, depending on what condition comes in the door, depending on the context, I may need to dig into areas of your health data. And, and being able to do that in an unfettered way as a provider, especially if you're in the emergency department, if you're in the OR, if you're in labor and delivery, if, you know, et cetera, it, I think it's really important that people understand that if you want to get safe, high quality care, it needs to be informed by your health data. I think I would... Oh, go ahead, Grace. I think I would jump in and say that from the patient and care partner perspective, having that access to information decreases time toxicity or that burden of needing to do all this legwork to try to collect everything. It decreases financial toxicity because if you have your information, you can now start asking questions about how do I get this care and how do I afford the care? How do I access the care in the first place? And then it also just allows you to make informed, educated decisions about your care and lets you reclaim your power so that you can take action in a way that is in alignment with your goals, your quality of life and where you are. Yeah, Grace, you, you took the words out of my mouth. You know, what I'm going to say is empowerment, right? From the patient perspective, if you're hesitant about this, having interoperability and access to your health data from all different types of providers and institutions that you've visited gives you power as a patient to understand your health and to really understand what's going on with your body in a way that maybe you didn't pay attention to before, right? Or maybe you didn't think you could access that data because obviously there's a lot of debates over data ownership and things like that. And now I think it's, it's giving that power back to the patients. And yes, it comes with a lot of burdens and a lot of responsibilities, but I think I think we're really moving into a space where patients want that data, that information, and want the ability to be able to control the healthcare decisions that they make. And that all comes from data empowerment. Mohamed, would you like to pause it and answer as well? Yeah, I, I think the only thing I'm thinking to add is that there is also the angle of the general efficiency in the entirety of the system that 
it will benefit us all. So if, if we are able to run a smoother um, system in, at large, then we all benefit from it. And I think interoperability is one of the points where we can reduce the frictions and remove some of the points where inefficiencies and inaccuracies can, can be, get introduced into the system at large. Yeah, and I have a few uh, questions from the Q&A that I think one actually speaks to what you're talking about. Um, this is from Jordan. Jordan asks, could you talk about the role of patient experience in addressing the lack of consumer confidence in health data privacy? I think, uh, so there's, there's the angle of awareness that we already addressed, but I think there's also a, a lot of things that technology can do to provide more choice, more control, and also more aware uh, after the fact awareness in terms of auditing and monitoring and accounting of disclosure for, for the patient. And I think uh, arguably like I, I, knowing what happened to the, your data after the fact could even be more powerful in, in the sense of uh, being in charge uh, compared to having control because you're not burdened with making a lot of the decisions, but you can passively kind of look at what happened to your data. So there's th those areas that I think that connects with the end user and the patients that technology can do more. And also there's a lot that technology can do in terms of uh, assisting patients to understand the privacy choices that the providers and the, tech, the, the apps and, and, and the vendors have made in a way that can, you know, make, make them power to make decisions and make sense of you know, the pile of legal documents and technological documents uh, uh, to to navigate through those. So th so I, I guess those are the areas I would highlight at least. I I think that's exactly right. And I'm really watching the sort of technology of contextual consent. And there's a lot of debate amongst privacy professionals about how much burden you put on the patient to make the choices. And that's a very important thing that I don't want to. Again, it's a whole other conversation, but. When a choice is being offered, is it being is the UX is the user interface clear? Um, is a dark pattern employed? Are there default yeses and nos? Does the person know what is the data that's going to be transacted in that consent? Technology can really help that when it's done properly. And Stephen and Grace, you both had little fingers up. Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, so patient experience obviously is a big word, right? But but I mean, I'm thinking about it. I think if a patient feels that they are being listened to by their provider, they're more likely to feel confident that their, their data is going to be well cared for. If they feel like they're being ignored or blown off, I'm sure that they'll, they'll also have real concerns about the privacy of the data. The other thing is, you know, we've had portals now for over 20 years, and everyone theoretically has access to their clinician's notes. So I think it's really helpful when we encourage patients to go review their notes, because then they know what's in that data. What is the data that got captured? Was it an accurate representation of their experience of the encounter? So I think that's something that we can do with patient experience is, is encourage that engagement with their data. I would just add, we need to do a better job of sharing already available public resources that are in the public domain. HealthIT.gov has a plethora of all kinds of resources that would be valuable to patients. And I never see it in any hospital setting. I've never come across it once blogged in a new or in a newsletter or anything, not at the health information management department. So I think everybody gets an F on that effort and we can do a, a good job across the board, across the nation by simply sharing what's already available and highlighting and celebrating that as a resource for all the patients and families that walk through our doors. And I think we can now take this and apply it to a specific use case and a question from Carol for the attorneys. Is anyone able to speak to Maryland's new law regarding reproductive health data being shared for certain purposes with entities outside of Maryland? Likewise, would anyone be willing to speak about the implications of Washington's new My Body, My Data law? Um, Bethany, do you want to take that since you're in the reproductive space? And I'm not tracking Maryland. I do know Washington, but I haven't tracked Maryland. Now I have to go look it up. <laughs> yes, no, and and Washington could be honestly its own webinar uh, with the My Body, My Data law. It is it is a huge shift. 
you know, what I will say is we have seen a lot of, of shifts amongst how we think about reproductive health data because of the sensitive nature of that data now, right, and the changing abortion landscape that we have. And we've started to see laws like Maryland um, and other states that are doing what we call abortion shield laws, where they're trying to give more protection to reproductive health data by saying, for instance, if you come to, to Maryland, right, and get your reproductive health care here, we won't share your data with entities outside of Maryland who could be using that data for reproductive health care crimes, um, you know, to prosecute those types of actions. And so we see also, you know, um, protections for providers, right? If you provide care while you're in Maryland, right, we, we're we not going to, you know, extradite you to another jurisdiction to face charges. And so we've started to see those types of laws come into place, not just in Maryland, but in a lot of other states. And it is interesting because we're putting in barriers with respect to data exchange that haven't existed before. Now, these and it's, of course, you know, state by state, depending on what the state law is, you know, but states like Maryland, for instance, you know, their prohibitions on sharing of reproductive health data are typically in the context of law enforcement, right, and subpoenas and court actions related to reproductive health care crimes. So that wouldn't, for instance, stop your data from going, you know, to another provider who's outside of Maryland who needs that data, you know, for your health care or for your patient, you know, um, patient portal, that type of thing. What could happen potentially, right, that, that we need to think about is once that data is in the hands of other providers outside of Maryland, right? If that data gets subpoenaed in a, in a lawful way in which, you know, that data is later disclosed, right? That reproductive health care data from other states in which may have been protected over there could potentially be part of those records. Um, so there's, there's a lot of moving parts right now, I will say that we have in the reproductive health care space. We've also started to see laws like, for instance, New York has passed a law where it's saying that if uh, providers do telemedicine abortion across state lines. They'll be protected for those types of practices. Um, you know, that I think raises a lot of legal issues when we think about just the practice of medicine in general and practicing across state borders. And now you're getting into um, controlling how other states are allowing the practice of medicine to happen within their jurisdiction. So I think, you know, these laws coming out for protecting reproductive rights are great. I think we're going to see a lot of challenges to them and a lot of, you know, challenges to how they're being implemented down the line. Um, but Lucia, if there's anything you'd like to add. No, I, I mean, that's it, right? States who are liberal are going to try and protect their citizens and their providers and states who are um, uh, more anti-abortion are going to try to enforce those laws. And you'll just see, uh, it's, it'll be a very complicated landscape, particularly for patients and doctors in particular. And this is not DIY, like literally find a lawyer you trust and work with them. Do not do this yourself. So I'm going to throw out one last question, and I think it'll be about time to wrap this up. This is from Janice. Since we're talking about patient access, are there any comments on how to improve access for disabled patients, especially those who cannot use portals because of their disability? I mean, we do have federal standards for internet um, accommodation, and I, people should use them, right? And I think that the same agency, actually, HHSOCR is the enforcer of federally funded programs and whether they're available to people of all abilities. So that's the that's the way that gets fixed, in, in my opinion. Grace and Stephen, do either of you um, have any idea of if that's actually happening in practice? Not sure. That Great questions, but some of the boots on the ground experience that I've had has literally just required calling in and speaking to a human being and saying, this is the circumstances and people have always been very accommodating from my experiences, though I can only speak, you know, for me and myself operating out of New Jersey, um, pick up that phone call, be specific about what your needs are, what you're looking to accomplish and how you need the information. And um, I have been fortunate and hopeful that people's experiences and, and needs will be heard and met. Well, and I think the information blocking rule also specifies that, that patients need to be granted access to their data in the form and format that they request it. You know, mm -hmm. so hopefully we're seeing some responsiveness there. 
It's interesting because I also see this happening when I think about the health tech space, right, and, and apps that may not necessarily be subject to certain federal rules and regulations. You know, there's a lot of apps out there, I can say, that are, you know, taking health data and they're not designed for individuals with disabilities um, and they're not ADA compliant, right, or user friendly or incorporating best practices. Um, and it kind of raises the question of, you know, how do we get them to comply with these standards, um, even if they're not mandated to, right, but, but being more inclusive of the entire population? Um, it's, it's an interesting question. I don't, I don't think we have the answer yet. And, and there are standards of usability and uh, accessibility. They're well-established standard. They don't cover all kinds of uh, cases, but they will provide some kind of a baseline. And I think that those can be included in some of the uh, regulatory requirements. Well, I want to thank you all for your thoughtful responses. Um, and for those running the show behind the scenes, thank you for sharing a bit of your time and expertise with all of us today. To the audience, uh, thank you for joining us on this brief odyssey into patient privacy. Uh, we wish you all well, and we apologize for not answering all of the Q&A questions. Thanks, thank Sandy, for moderating. Thank you all.